There are many different overloaded versions of the print line method. And each overloaded version requires a different type of incoming parameter. For example, different overloaded versions of the print line method know how to receive incoming parameters of each of the eight primitive types and convert them to characters and to display the characters on the screen. There is an overloaded version of the print line method that requires an incoming parameter of type object. This is the version of the method that is executed when the reference to this object is passed to the print line method on the right of your screen. The reference to this object can be treated as either its true type or as the type of any of its superclasses. Therefore, in this case, the reference can be treated as any of the following types. The true type, which is prob0 for my class, the immediate superclass, which is prob0 for, and the superclass of that class, which is object. The overloaded version of the print line method that is involved here requires an incoming parameter of type object because this object's reference can be treated as type object it will satisfy the type requirement for the overloaded version of the print line method that requires an incoming parameter of type object so the question is how does the overloaded print line method know what it should display when it receives an incoming parameter of type object? If an overloaded print line method receives an int value as an incoming parameter, it knows that it should convert that value into numeric characters and possibly a minus sign and display those characters on the screen. If an overloaded version of the print line method receives a boolean value as an incoming parameter, it knows that it should convert that value to either the characters that spell true or the characters that spell false and display those characters on the screen. However, since there are potentially an infinite number of different classes from which objects can be instantiated, whose references can be passed to the print line method, it isn't nearly as obvious what the print line method should display when it receives an incoming parameter that is a reference to an object. To resolve this dilemma, the first thing that this version of the print line method does is to call the toString method on the incoming object's reference. Then it displays the string value that is returned by the toString method on the standard output device, which in most cases is the command line screen. In this case, the overridden toString method returns the string Baldwin, 
which you see displayed on this line on the bottom right of your screen. This is an example of an object-oriented programming concept known as runtime polymorphism. Runtime polymorphism is much too complicated to fully explain in this lesson. However, I will explain it in some detail in my I do explain it in detail in my online object-oriented programming tutorials numbered 1600 through 1630. You will find those tutorials at www.dickbaldwin.com. I strongly recommend that you study it there until you thoroughly enjoy it. Runtime polymorphism, in my opinion, is the most important concept in all of object-oriented programming. It is absolutely critical that you understand runtime polymorphism. If you expect to go further than this course, doing object-oriented programming in Java. It is almost impossible to write a useful Java application without making heavy use of runtime polymorphism. Among other things, runtime polymorphism is the foundation for the event-driven Java graphical user interface system. Getting back to the code on the right of your screen, the highlighted expression uses the object's reference to call the overridden get data method. The value that is returned from that overridden get data method is passed to the print line method for display on the screen. As we saw earlier, the overridden get data method now showing on the bottom right of your screen returns a copy of the random value that was received and saved by the constructor for the class named prob04 my class. Finally, the last statement in the main method in the code on the right of your screen displays the contents of the instance variable named random number. The instance variable named random number contains the random value that was passed to the constructor for the class named prob04 my class. Therefore, the final two statements in the main method highlighted on the right of your screen display the same random value. This is shown in the command line output which is displayed on the bottom right of your screen. In this case, the random value was 95, and that same random value was displayed by the two statements 
that I'm pointing to now. After these two statements that are highlighted on the right of your screen, finish executing. The main method has nothing more to do. At that point in time, since there are no graphic images being displayed on the computer screen, the program terminates and returns control to the operating system. So let's summarize what you learned in this lesson. You learned about abstract methods and you learned about abstract classes and you learned a little about overridden methods in general. In addition, you saw an example of runtime polymorphism. You also learned about overriding the two-string method, and you learned a little about using random numbers. That concludes lecture number four, titled Abstract Methods, Abstract Classes, and Overridden Methods. You will find more on these topics on my website at www.dickbaldwin.com.